Hi everyone. Uh, we're going to talk today about patent medicine advertising. We're also going to talk about it next week. Uh, this is a really important form of early advertising. It was very prominent. There was there was lots of this types of advertising that you would have seen in the late mid to late 1800s. But it's it's also important because it influences certain forms of health promotion today. And we're going to make the connections between this historical patent medicine advertising and some of the more recent day uh, kind of versions of that. All right. So before we start with the historical material, I'd like you to look at this clip I have here. It's from the, the TV show Dragon's Den. And you're, you're probably familiar with the show. Uh, it features these, um, these entrepreneurs and they financially back various pitches or, or not back pitches that come uh, on the show, people that come on the show. And what I want you to do is look at the pitch made by this particular uh, promoter for a product called NeuroConnect. Uh, and I want you to pay particular attention to the kinds of claims he makes for the product and the kinds of forms of persuasion he makes for it in terms of its effectiveness and the kind of evidence that he presents in terms of backing up those claims. All right. So look at this clip. It's about uh, 10, 15 minutes and then come back and then we'll we'll carry on with the rest of the lecture. All right. OK. So hopefully you're back after having seen the clip. Now here's uh, what we're going to talk now with respect to historical patent medicines. Now these uh, products sort of came on the scene uh, in the early 1800s, but really became quite prominent by the mid to late 1800s. Now what were patent medicines? Well, these were just a variety of products that promised some kind of health benefit to the user. So these could have been things like like herbal or botanical compounds that were uh, you know put together in some kind of an ingredient mix. Sometimes they were they, they could be tonics, and that would be something that you would you would drink typically for aiding indigestion and the like. They could be various types of oils, like a like a liniment oil that you would rub on you to provide some kind of a benefit, perhaps to deal with sore muscles or something like that. Uh, they had very colorful names. I've put a couple up here, uh, Dr. Dupanko's Golden Periodical Pills, Hamlin's Wizard Oil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In the early 1800s, around 1804, there were about 80 of these types of brands or, or products that were out there. By the mid 1800s, uh, you can see there were about 1,500 of them there, uh, different brands. And they promised to do virtually everything in terms of a health benefit. So they promised to cure you of various types of diseases, you know, gout, liver disease, epilepsy, uh, sexually transmitted uh, infections, uh, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, virtually nothing was unavailable in terms of the product claims that these uh, these types of um, these types of brands would make. So these were uh, roughly speaking in some various categories. So the first category, which um, in many respects was one of the more prominent ones, were forms of painkillers. So I've put a couple examples here. Mrs. Winslow's uh, soothing syrup, uh, Orangine is another one. These products typically contain some measure of or not, uh, a narcotic, so, so a slight amount of opium or cocaine in terms of the, uh, the mid to late 1800s. And so in that case, they would have a, a kind of um, a soothing effect in terms of, the, of the, uh, the opiate or the cocaine having that kind of effect on the user. Now, in the case of Mrs. Winslow's, there was a tragic outcome of that. The product was actually promoted for dealing with colicky babies or babies that cried a lot. And so the uh, product was promoted as a way you, you could give this product to the babies. Hey, and lo and behold, they stopped crying. Well. They probably stop crying because there's a bit of opioid in the product and so the baby would then fall asleep uh, sadly there were a number of baby deaths associated with this product because of course the the mothers were effectively giving the product too frequently to the baby and the baby died which was which was tragic some of the products were more in a kind of miracle cure kind of uh, category so these would be products that would promise to cure you of things that were just not even curable at the time 
uh, things like cancer or, or, or deafness. Uh, some of the products even promise to cure you of the addiction that you might have uh, developed to another patent medicine. So for example, if you were taking Mrs. Winslow's because of the opioids that were in it, um, other products were promising to get you off opioids, um, and again, often with very, very dubious claims. So these products were, um, uh, as I said, they were things that you could swallow. They were things that you could um, rub on your body. But, but starting in the 1860s and 70s, there was even a category of patent medicines that involved various types of products that you would apply to the body, especially products that were using electricity and what was called electrotherapy to provide a purported medicinal or health benefit. So in keeping with the times, electricity comes on the scene in the uh, 1870s and 80s. Uh, it's seen as like almost like a miracle, a, a miracle invention at the time, right? It's this thing that can actually light lights and do all kinds of things in terms of operating appliances and the rest. So people often had a kind of wonder awestruck initial understanding of that. For that reason, it was also thought by some that you could may, maybe have some other types of health benefits that would come out of this. And so you saw a whole rash of products starting in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, products like electro belts that you would wear, um, electric uh, hairbrushes and corsets. These would typically have, a, a, there'd be kind of a belt that have, would have some kind of wiring in it, copper coils or zinc or whatever, possibly a, a battery that would generate a small amount of electricity in the device. And these products were sold in a variety of ways for promoting and treating a variety of, of illnesses, you know, hernias, impotence, tiredness, liver disease, uh, even some for cancer. So in, in that sense, they were, um, they were widely available in this period in the 1870s and 80s. But subsequent evidence or studies have shown that probably more than 99% of them were ineffective. Uh, there just was no sort of medical kind of claim or study that you could look at to show what, if any kind of medicinal or health benefit that could have come from using these products. They were nonetheless heavily advertised. So if you picked up a, a copy of the Sears catalog in the 1880s, you would have seen many, many of these types of products uh, uh, being advertised, promoting a whole variety of, of benefits. And they, these ads uh, also used um, testimonials as a form of product endorsement. These would have come in the, mostly from people like doctors or supposed doctors and, and actresses and other types of celebrities. We're, we're going to come back to, to testimonials, um, probably more so next week, as an intrinsic form, a very important form of advertising, a very important component of advertising for for patent medicines. Okay, so why were these things so popular? We saw the growth from a, you know, a few dozen brands of patent medicines in the early 1800s to more than 1,500 of them by 1860. Why, why such demand for these products that are purporting to cure you of all types of health problems? Well, for one, you have to consider that illness was far more commonplace during this time period than would be the case today. That people got sick more often and they died prematurely more often than is the case today. So illness is just a kind of more common feature of society. And for that reason, of course, people are more, um, they're, they're more likely to seek out remedies for things that would afflict them or ail them. The other factor to look at, and this is more specific to the United States, is that uh, the Civil War which uh, ran from 1861 to 1865, produced a lot of fatalities and a lot of casualties during the war itself. But there were many veterans or survivors of that war that had ongoing health problems related to their time in service, right? They could have been uh, had you know gunshot wounds or something like that that didn't heal properly. There could have been other types of pain that they lived with in subsequent years because of their war experience. And so for that, way, for that reason, there were just hundreds of thousands of people in the United States that just would have been potentially 
um, more receptive of a product or a message that dealt with chronic pain. Uh, so there were um, like people like that that were sort of chronic pain sufferers. It was also a society where most people worked doing forms of manual labor, which was physically demanding. And so that meant that your body was put under a greater toll and hence your body would be more likely to have aches and pains and other types of things than say if you were working as a teacher or an accountant or something. Um, the other uh, interesting factor here is that this was a time period as you get into the 1870s and 80s where increasingly temperance and, and prohibition is becoming more popular. And so there's more social opposition to drinking alcohol and even other types of things like cocaine use or opioids. Uh, and so, but particularly with alcohol, as, as there's more of a social stigma attached to drinking alcohol, one of the ways you could access alcohol was through patent medicines. And it was more socially acceptable to be using that product if in fact uh, you wanted to get some alcohol in your system. Typically patent medicines were, uh, the preservative agent in them was alcohol. So you wanted to make sure the product lasted a, a while on the shelf. And so you preserve the ingredients in alcohol. And so for that reason, if you were just taking a few tablespoons of the product, you were probably taking in anywhere from 10 to 15% alcohol that was, uh, that was part of the preservative agent of that. So that's, um, you know, you could see that as a kind of acceptable form of, of drinking at a time when certain segments of society were frowning upon that. The other thing to look at is the nature of the society in terms of where people lived. Um, at this time, about 80% of Americans and Canadians, and here I'm talking about the 1870s or 80s, would have been uh, classified as rural society members or living in a rural area. So for that reason, when you live in a rural area, you're just further away from things like maybe access to a doctor or access to some other types of medical facilities. So you're more remote and you're more likely to look for other sources uh, of help with respect to health care and the rest. And the other point to consider in this society in the U.S. and Canada was just the greater sense of self-reliance that people had, that people were used to just taking care of themselves in a whole variety of ways that we wouldn't necessarily do today. So the idea that if you were sick and you could um, figure out what you could do yourself to deal with that in terms of whether it's a home remedy or some other type of thing you could buy yourself or talk to people or try and work it out primarily on your own. That, that self-reliance was a virtue in, in the society then as opposed to perhaps today. And so for that reason, people were often distrusting of professionals and so-called medical doctors. There might've been more uh, distrust in that sense than would be the case uh, today. Uh, the other thing to think about is the weak allopathic medical system. Now, the allopathic medical system is more or less what we have today. When, when you get sick, you visit your doctor. That's somebody who typically has a medical degree. They've gone to medical school. They've gone through certain types of training to be able to prescribe you medicine or to give you medical advice, etc. If you have some kind of serious problem, you would see a specialist. Again, these are people that have had different types of training through the medical system, through the medical school systems that exist in, say, Canada and the U.S. That's generally speaking the allopathic medical system. That system in the 1870s did not exist very much. Uh, there were elements of that. It was starting. There were medical schools that were starting. But many people actually did not have access to medical doctors in that sense. All right. And... The other thing that's interesting is that even some of the doctors, the medical doctors that would have come out of medical school and the like, even some of them would have used or prescribed or given patent medicines to their patients as opposed to prescription medicines uh, entirely. So they were kind of in a gray area, these doctors. They would kind of work with, with um, uh, things they learned from medical school, but in some cases, some of them would even sort of lean on patent medicines and, and recommend them to patients as well. And then the other factor as to why patent medicines would have become popular is just the longstanding experience that people had with doing their own home remedies. 
Uh, this is often found with women in the family, the mother or the grandmother. They would have often had a home remedy that would have been passed down from generation to generation. This would have been some remedy that you would have used but botanical agents or plants or whatever, and you would have sort of put, uh, you know, boiled it on the stove and made some kind of a remedy that might have been useful in past generations uh, as well and was, was handed down. And they would use this for a variety of things like dealing with aches and pains and, and other types of um, more common afflictions, say menstrual pain or something like that. So the tradition of home remedy use was widespread. And so it's not that much of an extension to think, well, I, I, you know, I, I may not have somebody in my house that can make this for me, but these products that are sold, these patent medicine products, seem to somehow reflect that type of home remedy tradition. And so they're more inclined to think about buying them in that sense. The other factor to understand is just how easy it was to start a patent medicine business or an operation. There was, there was something called low uh, entrance barriers. So it meant that you did not have to have a lot of money up front to start these kinds of businesses. You did not have to invest in large factories to make this product. Uh, essentially, in the, uh, the start period, you would just come up with a, a, a kind of remedy, uh, a concoction that you would put together, and then you'd start to think about how you would sell and promote that. And we'll talk later about the importance of advertising in that fact as well. Now, when these patent medicine makers start to advertise their products, of course, there's a great uh, uh, availability of places to do that because of the a large increase in newspapers that are that is also happening at this time. Newspapers are opening almost every day in some of these uh, parts of the United States and Canada. And, and lots of newspaper growth and newspapers require advertising. And so the patent medicine makers were able to find um, a ready source for the advertising they wanted to issue in the form of newspaper growth. And then finally, I think when we think about these products, they should, as you're gonna see that some of them we look at are really kind of, I mean, they make outrageous claims. They promise to cure you of cancer and deafness. And so you might think, well, why should we take them seriously? Because they were clearly trying to fool people or trying to take advantage of them. And people might have not as, maybe they weren't as smart back then as they were today. We would know today not to take a product to promise a cure for cancer or something like that. And I think we, we don't want to be dismissive of, of patent medicines. We want to be wary of them today. And we'll talk about that in terms of sort of modern day kinds of patent medicines. But we don't want to be dismissive of large segments of society that were taking these products. And in part because, as we're going to see, some of these types of products still linger with us today. And I just want to read you a, a little bit of a quote from an author who did some work on this uh, historical work. And what she said was that at least some patent medicines then should be taken seriously as medications even the ones that probably were not very effective. Um, as she says, the like, like the purchasers of NyQuil today or even vitamin C today, many people who bought uh, Lydia Pinkham's uh, patent medicine or others were looking for relief from everyday ailments that they did not consider consequential enough to merit a doctor's attention. So there were lots, been lots of things in your life where you, for whatever reasons, you couldn't access a doctor or couldn't afford to go to a doctor. And, and you would have just sort of looked at what was available and you might've turned to those patent medicines uh, uh, to do that. Okay, so the example, I just got a slide up here from a story that appeared in the press, but you can find other types of uh, stories like this. So here's an, uh, an article from, uh, uh, it's about 10 or 15 years ago, actually. And it's basically, I'll just read you a little bit of this. Uh, despite the billions spent every year in this country on over-the-counter cough syrups, most such medicines do little, if anything, to relieve coughs, the nation's chest physicians say. So this was a, a sort of study that was done. Uh, that these over-the-counter cough syrups contain drugs in either too low a dose to be effective 
or they contain combinations of drugs that have never been proven to treat coughs. So something to think about, right? Probably like you, uh, like, you know, you like I, you know, for, for many, many years, when I would get a cough, uh, at times I would think, well, you know, maybe I'll pick up some cough medicine in, in shoppers or the drugstore or something like that. And we never, I never really thought about it. I would have assumed that it would have had some kind of medicinal effect because it's, you know, it's sold in a drugstore or it's, it's available, you know, widespread. And in fact, when you look at it, um, cough medicines are one of those sectors where there's actually not a lot of evidence to show that they actually are clinically shown to be working. So you have to ask, well, maybe my throat feels better. My cough feels a little bit better after taking the medicine. Well, that could mean that you could be taking, I don't know, honey and hot water. And it might actually have the same effect as the so-called cough medicine. You could be thinking, well, I've got these cough lozenges and they, they stop my coughing. But what maybe just having another type of candy lozenge would do the same thing, right? Maybe it's just the act of sort of lubricating your throat through the candy or the lozenge is all that matters. So something to think about, right? There are many things that we do, I would argue, uh, in terms of the choices we make for low level kinds of illnesses, like having a cough or a cold, where we buy things where we, we may not necessarily be buying things that have been clinically shown to be effective. We're buying things that we think are, we're buying things that are often extensively advertised as saying that they are effective, but they may not in fact have a, a definite clinical benefit. I mean, I, when I say clinical, that their, their benefits have been determined by clinical studies and other types of uh, scientific studies, all right? So something to think about for, for Tuesday is just other examples of products that you might have you might take, or uh, or people that you know would take, that may not really. You may think that there's some kind of clinical evidence of effectiveness, but there may not in fact be that much. So there have been just to give you a couple of examples. There was a product. I don't think it's still advertised much today, but it was called Cold FX FX, and it was basically a product that said you know during cold season. Uh, which would be in the winter. If you take this product every day, it's going to make you less likely to get a cold, give you some kind of immunity against that. And what subsequent studies show that the product really didn't do that at all. It was, if anything, mostly just a placebo effect. Other um, products, uh, uh, well, I'm just going to, I'll listen to some of yours on Tuesday, but I've had people talk about oregano oil uh, for medicinal benefits as well even forms of juicing and some of the cleansing that's being done uh, again not a lot of evidence showing that there's a you know profound kind of or noticeable health benefit for some of these things so so think of the products that you encounter in your world and products that you think are performing a medicinal benefit and, and then maybe we can sort of talk about some more examples like that on on tuesday now we looked at the uh, the NeuroConnect product on Dragon's Den. Now what I'd like you to do is watch how this uh, CBC show called Marketplace, how this show treats the product. And in part, they, they, they come to this product, they come to the story because of what happened on Dragon's Den. So watch this episode. It's about... Um, about 15 minutes and um, I want you to pay attention to a couple things in particular. One is the um, the interview with the magician in there and he, he says some really interesting things about um, sleight of hand and parlor tricks and he refers to ma magicians as, as honest liars. And I want you just to think about that in terms of what we talked about last week with respect to the, the trickster tradition and, and Barnum and the rest. And I want you to also, when you're looking at this episode, to think about, um, I think the title of it is sort of science or snake oil. And snake oil is another term for, for patent medicine. Um, think about how the, um, the owner of the company presents evidence for the effectiveness of his product and what he relies on when he doesn't. And take special mention of any times he uses testimonials. 
where he says, uh, well, my patients say this and, and other people say this. And any instances where he's actually using individuals to give a first-hand endorsement of the product in terms of what they think of it for the effectiveness. All right. So look at that episode and then uh, and then come back. Okay. Now, there are lots and lots of examples of kind of new age uh, brands or health products out there that would um, fit into what I call the Gwyneth Paltrow goop mold. And I've just put um, some examples up here. What I want you to do is for Tuesday is to think of how other examples that would come to mind in terms of a kind of celebrity endorser that's uh, promoting products under an umbrella brand name like, like Goop or whatever, promoting products for a kind of general health benefit. It could be specific things. It could be um, more in terms of vitality and energy or whatever the case may be. So here, I just Googled some headlines. I think I put, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow Goop and saw what came up. Um, this was a year or two ago. And you can see here that these headlines deal with the fact that this company is encountering problems from regulators, like health regulators, government regulators, for the claims that they're making. And in some cases, there is even um, lawsuits that are resulting from that. So uh, think about that in terms of other examples that you can come up with on your, on your own. Okay, now we wanna spend some time looking at the specific advertising aspects of patent medicines. So the reason why I'm talking about patent medicines is not because it's an interesting part of medical history or something. I'm talking about them because they were heavily advertised for their time. So a typical um, sales or advertising to sales ratio for patent medicines was around 40%. So what that means is say you have a patent medicine company, say you're selling these, these tooth drops here on the slide. And in the first year, you make $100,000 in sales. A patent medicine company typically then reinvests 40% of that back into advertising. So 40,000 of the 100,000 goes right back into advertising. So that's, that's high. It's a very high ratio of advertising spending in relation to revenue. So if we think of today, um, prominent advertising companies like, like Coca-Cola, for example, I mean, their ad to, um, ad to sales ratios would be in the range of 10 to 15%. So 40% is very high. And so for that reason, they, they, they seem to realize these companies that the way to financial success would be paved by the volume of advertising and the type of advertising you engaged in. The other thing to consider is that some of these uh, brands effectively became national advertisers. Some of these companies, they almost all started locally in a particular kind of city or an area, and then they would have expanded into the, maybe that region. But at some point, they start selling the product on a national basis so that within, say, maybe 5, 10, 20 years or whatever it is after starting, that product is now going to be available in Seattle and New York and Florida and Toronto or whatever the case may be. So these are some of the first national advertisers in the US and Canada. They're, they're doing this type of advertising even before companies like Coca-Cola and Procter and & Gamble and others that we know today were doing national advertising. They were also pioneers of, of sorts in terms of branding and trademarking, especially with respect to trademarking. There was a, there was a realization that the, the label you had on your, uh, the packaging or the label that you had on your product had to have a particular kind of look. You would trademark that design, that 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 look of the product, and 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 similarly, the brand would you would try to be consistent with your your messaging for the product. And so you, there was some thinking that you were actually coming up with early forms of branding. And later we'll talk about branding in more detail in this course. There, the volume of the advertising speaks to the fact that in, in around 1860, about half of all newspaper ads in the US would have been patent medicine ads. Well, that's extraordinary in the amount, right? Um, that percentage would decline as other product sectors started to advertise more. 
but even still by 1890, about a third of all advertisements in, in American papers and, and probably Canadian papers um, would have been uh, patent medicine ads. So anybody reading a newspaper at this time is seeing lots and lots and lots of these ads. They're ubiquitous. Uh, they're, they're readily uh, available in terms of the advertising. You would see them in other venues as well, as we'll talk about in a second. The uh, last point here, point number five, is what were called the red clause contracts between patent medicine advertisers and newspaper owners. So what do we mean by a red clause contract? Well, it works like this. If, if uh, you were a patent medicine company, and let's say you wanted to advertise in a bunch of newspapers in New York, New York State, and you would write up the contract that would say, you know, I'm gonna get this amount of advertising space, we're gonna spend this amount of money on, on the ads, et cetera, et cetera. And then there would also be another clause, often in red ink. That's why it was called the red, the red clause. And that clause basically would say, in the event that a local legislature or a local government body passes legislation which is harmful to the patent medicine industry or to our company, the terms of this contract are null and void. I mean, basically, uh, we don't have to honor the, the contract anymore. Now, why would they have that in, you know, in a straight kind of advertising contract? Why would you? Well, they, they have that there because they realized, especially as you get into the 1880s and 90s, when there were forms of opposition to patent medicines because people were complaining that they were ineffective or that they were harmful. The patent medicine companies realized that they, they did not want government to start passing regulations or laws limiting the patent medicine industry or, or putting uh, some other types of restraints on it. So they effectively got newspapers to help them with that by providing those newspapers an economic incentive, because the economic incentive for newspapers is that they want to keep getting the patent medicine advertising. You provide those newspapers an economic incentive to not investigate patent medicines, to stay clear of that issue, to not do you know, stories about it, to not have critical kind of pieces appear in their papers about the patent medicine industry, and then to not want to cover if governments are thinking about legislating on this issue, then the newspapers may have less of an incentive to cover that reporting as well. So those red clause contracts speak to the power of advertisers, right? The powers of advertisers to influence the reporting of different types of media, in this case, in this case, newspapers. Now, I've talked about newspaper advertising. Uh, but these uh, patent medicine ads would have appeared in many other venues as well. They would have appeared in trade cards, um, outdoor advertising. So you would have seen them on billboards. Um, almanacs were a common thing. A patent medicine company would sort of sponsor an almanac and its advertising would appear throughout, throughout the almanac. The other thing that was interesting is that patent medicine companies developed traveling me medical shows. And these would be... Um, shows that would go from town to town and they could be a variety of things they could be like maybe a vaudeville act or sometimes they were um, a kind of play or a magic act or a minstrel show and these acts were um, uh, these traveling shows would go from town to town and often in rural areas small towns so for many of these areas this was kind of the only entertainment they might get for a while right except maybe when barnum came through or something and, and so there are not a lot of entertainment options. And so these shows would come in, they would be well attended. But the interesting thing is that they would, um, they were oftentimes free or, or very uh, cheap to, to enter. And, but what would happen was the sponsor of the show, the patent medicine company, at, at various intervals in the entertainment or in the show, the sponsor would stop things and would come out and talk about the product, right? and promote the product. And there would be kind of an intermission where this would happen, uh, sometimes two or three of them during the show. You could also, outside the show, there would be a booth set up where you could buy the product and that sort of thing. And so in effect, the interesting thing about this is that not only does it, did it provide a form of free entertainment or almost free for people living in those areas, but it also um, 
kind of got people used to the notion that entertainment could be paid for with a form of advertising or sponsorship, right? So another, sorry. So in other types of, um, other types of um, uh, entertainment, so if you, let's say you went to an opera or, or you went to some, a play or something like that in New York, well, you would just pay your admission and you would go in and see the show, right? And it would be over. Well, that's, that's not how, um, that's not how it would happen in um, in this venue, right? This venue was was one of sponsorship, and some have argued that when this was happening, say in the eighteen eighties and nineties and early nineteen hundreds, that when commercial radio comes along in the nineteen twenties, and that form of of entertainment was premised on advertising supporting program content. And the idea of sponsored advert, like sponsors of a show and the show providing entertainment and then breaking for intervals while the sponsor came in and promoted the product, that people were more willing to embrace that in radio because they had previously been familiar with that in the context of patent medicine, traveling medical shows. All right. Now, the latter point here I have is on the modern advertiser uh, or patent medicines as a modern advertiser in terms of the way it advertised, the, the, the nature of the advertising. And I want to just look at a few points here around symbolism, um, the prevalence of imagery over text or over words, and, and even the kind of sensationalist nature of some of this advertising. So let's look at these two ads. Now the ad on the left for BD's parlor organ is what would be called a product as information ad. It shows just a, a, a picture of the product, a sort of a woodcut image of this particular parlor organ. And then there's just a lot of text in the ad, which basically describes the product. It describes you know, what the features of it are, how, how it's used, how, what the quality, you know, all, the, all these sorts of things that deal with just the product itself. Uh, product as information ad. Now, if you look at the other ad, which is for a patent medicine called PARS English Pad, this one communicates somewhat differently. This one, in fact, the actual product is not really front and center at all, right? Um, you don't really see the product very carefully. What you see more so is a kind of form of symbolic communication for how the product works, its effectiveness, and what the product really is um, capable of doing so in this in this ad you see this woman who's not like a depiction of a 1880s woman she's a depicted almost of a mythical woman who's warding off the grim reaper she's warding off death and in, in the ad you see other symbols of death you see those those crows that are uh down there in the middle part of the ad you see uh, a, a person who seems to be sort of dying on the ground from um, malaria, whatever the other contagious disease that the ad is referencing. And, and you see a, a kind of heroic figure uh, warding this off and she's sort of wrapped around her would be a sort of representation of the, of, the, of the electric pad. Now, that's a form of symbolic communication, right? It's not a kind of direct, literal, text-based kind of rendition of what the product does and how it works and how it's effective, right? It tells it through, the, it tells the story about the product's effectiveness through symbolic uh, communication, through the use of these various symbols like the, Green, the Grim Reaper and others. And in that sense, you need images to do that. You don't just rely on text. And you can see here, it's a very kind of a colorful, almost over the top rendition. It's a very sensationalized depiction of this, right? In terms of using very graphic images like, like the Grim Reaper. So in this sense, patent medicine advertising would increasingly use forms of symbolic communication to convey meanings for their products and to persuade people about the merits of those products. And that's a hallmark feature of modern advertising, right? Most advertising today is not at all like that product on the left, which is just a picture of it in a bunch of text. Most advertising today speaks through symbols, through, through other, often through visual media in that sense. So patent medicines are important then because they also started to pioneer 
this type of advertising communication that becomes more or less a common feature of, of advertising throughout the 20th century. Okay, so the advertising orientation of patent medicines is uh, interesting in a couple other ways. For one, the term patent medicine. The patent did not involve patenting the ingredients of the product. Um, in fact, most patent medicine makers did not want to disclose what those ingredients were. They felt it was kind of a proprietary kind of uh, secret and they didn't want to share it. So the patenting, or more likely what the real term is trademarking, comes with the actual um, brand name and with the product design, with the, pro the packaging design and the logo that might have appeared with it, okay? So the emphasis here is on what one critic referred to as the printer's ink on the bottle, right? The packaging and the name and the branding. And I just want to read you um, a small quote here. This is from somebody in, uh, in the 1870s who's giving advice on how to get into the patent medicine industry. And he says, uh, to begin with, you need some money to be sunk in advertising. Next, you need a good advertising manager. Lastly, you need a formula, but that is of mighty small importance compared with the other two elements of the business, right? So the two main elements are advertising and then an ad, ad manager, somebody that can sort of tell you how to do the advertising and how to place it effectively, all right? Um, I wanna uh, go ahead a few decades. So now we're in the 1920s and it's a critic of the patent medicine industry. And he writes, the active ingredient in them, in the patent medicines, was not the medicine on the inside of the bottle, but the printer's ink on the outside, and the still larger amount of printer's ink that was administered through the eyes of the readers of the newspapers. So both of these people, what they're saying is that the way to understand patent medicines is through their advertising, it's through their branding, it's through the trademarking. It's not about the qualities of the ingredients inside per se. That's not really what determines success in this business. What determines success is your effectiveness as a marketer and, and primarily as an advertiser. Now, saying that the actual ingredients were not entirely inconsequential, because as I mentioned before, there was alcohol in most of them that was the preservative agent. And some of the earlier ones did have, like especially for painkillers, did have um, coca leaves and, and other, other opioid traces in them and that. So there would have been some kind of um, pharma uh, active ingredients in that sense. Um, the thing to think about is I've talked about how these products were, were meeting demand, right? This is a society where there's lots of illness. And, and even in, say after the Civil War, there's lots of chronic pain sufferers as well, right? Lots of illness, lots of pain, and the rest. But these products were also good at creating demand, not just meeting demand, but creating demand as well. So that means that if you're um, uh, somebody and you experience illness around you, let's say you saw uh, you know, your sister die of tuberculosis or you've seen other family members get seriously ill and the rest, it might well mean that you're, you're, you know, you're concerned that that could happen to yourself. It might mean that when you get a cough, you might be really worried about that turning into something serious like tuberculosis or whatever. And, and so these products were very, these, these brands, uh, patent medicine brands, were very effective at trying to kind of promote this hypochondria on the part of people, not just to sort of be worried about illnesses that are plausible, but even to get them to believe that all coughs are potentially life-threatening and all types of um, mild kind of illnesses that you might get in a day-to-day -day kind of sense could be the, the harbingers of something serious that could happen. And so they, they kind of promoted a sort of hypochondriac kind of state in people believing that the worst was always happening, uh, potentially happening with any form of illness that they encountered. So patent medicines were in the business of creating or building trust because you, um, 
there were lots and lots of them out there. So you had to connect with people, uh, you know, in a competitive environment. But you also had to make them believe that the product was going to help them. It's a, you know, it's a personal intimate thing to take a medicine, right? And so you want to ensure that there's trust there. And so what you see then is oftentimes the names of these patent medicine companies would include um, descriptors like, you know, doctor or professor, even when they had the, the people involved with these medicines had no actual medical credentials as all at all. Um, in some cases, they touted kind of medical affiliations. They said they were linked to a hospital organization or they were linked to a sanatorium or something like that. Again, some of these claims were made up, but the emphasis was on promoting these sorts of um, uh, these sorts of legitimation. Uh, some of them use religious symbolism or, or science symbolism, again, to sort of shore up the trust. And then lastly, the use of testimonials. Um, we'll talk about that a lot next week, but just to remember that testimonials from ordinary people, ordinary users of the product become very, very important. Now, I want to think about the patent medicine uh, sellers and the promoters in the context of the term, the trickster that we, that we talked about last week. So we talked about the trickster in light of Barnum and, and the idea that people were okay being fooled if they went in to see, say, the Fiji mermaid or something like that. They were okay being fooled as long as there was a spectacle, as long as there was entertainment, as long as there was sort of creative kind of aspects to the experience that people could enjoy as entertainment. And so in that sense, um, the trickster uh, descriptor I think does apply to Barnum. It gets more complicated when you look at patent medicines though, right? Because uh, these are these are serious things, right? It's your health, right? You know, in some cases it can be life or death depending on what your illness is, right? And so it's not the same as being kind of fooled when you go see General Tom Thumb or the Fiji Mermaid or whatever the case may be. So in that sense, um, the trickster descriptor is a bit more problematic for especially for patent medicines involving actual illnesses or serious illnesses but what you'll see as you get and we'll talk about this more next week is that as you get into the 1900s some of these patent medicines aren't really promising to treat you or cure you of a specific disease they're promising to kind of restore and invigorate you right uh and and Today, when you think about energy drinks and even some of the kind of multivitamin compounds that people take, um, there's a lot of those are sold with this promise of energizing you and invigorating you. And you actually find lots of examples of that in patent medicine advertising, especially in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, Coca-Cola actually starts as a patent medicine, promising relief from aches and pains sort of thing and other types of um Kind of, kind of kind of chronic pain uh, suffering that people might have had. But by the early 1900s, it's sort of morphed into being a kind of an energy drink that will revitalize you and give you some vim and vigor in your day. Okay. Now, so they, it's a, it's a more complicated argument to make in terms of the tricks. And I think in some cases it depends on what the product is and the kinds of claims that are being, being made with it. Now, the other thing to think about with respect to the um, the patent medicine is um, is a descriptor by um, uh, by a by a scholar of, of patent medicines, and she looks at this advertising, and she um, basically says that patent medicine advertisers were kind of liars. I mean, they often lied outright in terms of the claims that these products. Um, would make and the kind of effectiveness of these products. But she said that they were um, an important uh, aspect of the development of advertising in terms of the way we understand advertising as this gray area between truth and falseness. Right? And what she said was that patent medicine manufacturers and medicine showmen originated many advertising methods and the very idea of sponsorship their creativity and inventiveness in the realm of marketing knew no bounds. They did make the world that puts advertising on the fortune cookies and in the public parks 
um, the world where advertising is sold by actors who point out that they are not doctors, though they play them on TV, the world in which truth and falsehood are so difficult to ascertain. And I, I think it is important to think of patent medicines in this sense, right? That they may have been despicable in terms of some of the claims they made, sort of fooling people, getting people to buy products that would not cure them of their serious illnesses. But they are part of this, this tradition in advertising uh, today that makes us think of advertising as not a kind of realm of direct falsehood or direct truth telling. It's an in-between kind of gray area and it invokes both belief and disbelief on the part of the claims. Now, this is uh, going to just quickly deal with this figure, uh, Samuel Hopkins Adams. So he's an investigative journalist in the early 1900s. This is what's called the progressive era of American history. This is where there was a strong kind of reformist element in American society to sort of clean up politics, um, to reduce the power of big business and, and a number of other things. And out of this was something called the muckraker tradition or the muckraker critique. And this was often done by um, investigative journalists that would investigate uh, different social sectors and finding um, various types of uh, power abuses and the rest. And so this fellow, um, Adams, started doing investigations of the patent medicine industry in the early 1900s. And he wrote a series of articles that were published mostly in the magazine called Collier's. And, and it was um, basically exposing the industry for all kinds of things like fraud and, and the whether some, in some cases saying that the products, if you actually, the, he got the products and tested them and found out that some of them were entirely bogus or harmless, but others were actually harmful in terms of the, um, the dangerous ingredients in them. Um, he chronicled all the instances in which people got sick from these patent medicines. In some cases, they even died, like the example from Mrs. Winslow's syrup that was given to colicky babies. Um, uh, he thought of the patent medicine industry as a kind of... Uh, you know, a, a blight on the nation, on the moral health of the nation as well. So he, he even documented the way that the patent medicines uh, industry was, that they had these red clause contracts, that they were enmeshed with newspapers, that they used their money to influence governments, etc., etc. So this was the first uh, type of systematic kind of critique of this sector of the patent medicine sector. And you will see throughout the 20th, 20th century, a number, other, a number of other types of critiques of this industry that would happen. And, um, and, and Samuel Adams was the first one. Now, the question is, well, how does he do this? You know, could he, he's doing this for magazines. Wouldn't those magazines also be beholden to patent medicine advertisers for their, for their revenue? And the fact is, the answer is no, actually that certain magazines that started in the late 1800s, early 1900s, like, like Collier's and Ladies Home Journal and others, they actually made a, uh, a deliberate decision not to take patent medicine advertising. In some cases, it was just, be, in some cases it was for the reasons that, that Adams sort of uncovered that it was a kind of a dubious business. But in other cases, they didn't take the ads because they just thought it was sort of unsightly to have ads promising a cure of liver disease or other types of things or cancer. And why would you want to remind readers of the, you know, the poor health effects of, of, of society or living or people or whatever. So the, the magazines just had a sense of the proprietariness of their, of what they wanted to present as a magazine. And they didn't want to sort of have their readers learn about these unfortunate things. So in any event, they did not, most of them did not take patent medicine advertising. And for that reason, they were more able to go after the industry because they were not beholden to it for advertising revenue. Now, someone else who does not take advertising revenue is John Oliver and his show Last Week Tonight on HBO. And I have a, sh a short clip that you can watch just watch about four minutes from from four thirty about four minutes 30 seconds in until about eight minutes 30 seconds and this issue is on televangelism and especially the types of 
televangelists who claim to offer healing to their flock or their their the people who watch them on TV. And and look at what he describes here, right? Because before when we talked about whether the patent medicines were tricksters or not, one of the cases that's that John Oliver talks about is a woman who had cancer and came to believe that the treatment, the best treatment for her cancer was not to go and deal with the oncologists and the doctors and the chemotherapy, or whatever, that for her, the best treatment was to give money to a particular uh, televangelist. And that the through that as a kind of act of faith and the kind of power of healing that would come from that televangelist, that she would be cured. And in fact, of course, she wasn't. So that's one example of a kind of, um, of John Oliver inheriting that critique of the patent medicine industry today in the, and doing something similar to what um, Adams would, would have done a century or so before. All right, so look at that and then come back to the next slide. Okay, so there's, uh, for discussion on, on, uh, on Tuesday, I want you to come up with a list of products that you've encountered that you think would reflect, or that you, or you would think of them as a kind of modern day inheritor or modern day example of patent medicines. So I've just put a couple of these up here to get you thinking about it. Um, the one is the, the Q-Ray bracelet, which is a kind of form of pain or wellness jewelry. And I have a brief clip there that you can look at uh, with respect to that. But I also think you can make a case for the way aromatherapy is marketed in terms of the claims it makes. Like again, if it's a specific health claim, you know, that this is going to reduce your anxiety or, or if there's other types of specific health claims that are made with a product and there's not clinical evidence to support it, then um, we should be very suspicious of that, right? Um, some of the claims in chiropractic, uh, the chiropractic industry are not just limited to sort of helping you with back pain or something like that. In some cases, the claims go well beyond that. Again, someone might want to comment on that in terms of your own experience. And then there's a whole host of products. I mean, if you go on YouTube and, and look for patent medicine or, or sort of um, health infomercials or something like that, you'll find lots and lots of examples. I just pulled one up here, which is the clip on male enhancement uh, pills, pills that promise to make a particular part of one's body grow longer and, and the rest. I mean, these claims are, are foolish in terms of the sort of scientific or medical basis for them, but you'll see lots and lots of them, right? And what you want to look at is how they're, what kind of marketing discourse, what kind of persuasion, what kind of language they use and, and the like. And so, so come to a class on Tuesday with um, some of those examples, and we're going to talk about them in light of their, um, in light of how they connect with the patent medicine tradition. All right. Okay. So that's it for today. Take care. I'll see you Tuesday. Bye-bye.